Would you like to know how Don turned his passion for cards and collectibles into a six-figure business while only starting with $700? In this episode, we are talking to Don Joss, who's the owner of DJ Sports Cards. Don has managed to grow his store's revenue to a high six figures with only seven employees. Their store did so well that they received the nationwide coveted award from Upper Deck, the Steve James Award. Sometimes I'm making 100, 200% markup on the new product. Don't feel like you always have to be the cheapest. Mm -hmm. What are you spending on advertising per month? Nothing. Nothing. This card, DJ is selling for $4,000. Today, Don is gonna share with you guys how he actually got started, how you too can get started with very limited investment, some of the things that prevented him from scaling the business earlier in his career, and how you can optimize your business for maximum returns. A big mistake people make when valuing collectibles is they go onto the internet and find a random website and get a price for it. Don't do that. I'm selling through everything I can get and it's a struggle to keep my really? shelves full okay. and the margins are tremendous. We would greatly appreciate it if you would help us get to 200,000 subscribers by subscribing to our channel. Hit that like button and the bell so that you don't miss any videos and without further ado you guys, let's go meet Don. You must be Don. Yeah, good morning. I'm, Welcome I'm to DJ Sports Cards. Awesome, let's get into it. All right. All right, you guys, we're here with the owner, Don. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. To share his story, his business, and all the tips and tricks with you guys. So, Don, tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up starting DJ Sports Cards. Well, when I was younger, I actually grew up in this very neighborhood that my store is in. I've spent my whole life here, and I was a big collector of, like, comic books, and my brother had a baseball card collection, so I was always kind of in that world. Okay. And when I was probably 12 or 13, a comic and card store opened right down the street from here in our neighborhood, and that was like a dream come true because, you know, we didn't have to drive to Seattle to, to visit a specialty store. Right. And uh, I collected very seriously for a few years and I got more serious into baseball cards. But when I turned 16, I decided I wasn't going to collect cards anymore. They used to have uh, local uh, card conventions where you could rent a table and sell your cards. So I went and did that. I went to a card convention not far from here, sold pretty much all my good cards for $500. I went back and told the, uh, the owner of that store at the time how I made 500 bucks selling cards. And a couple days later, he called me and offered to sell out the baseball card portion of his comic and card business to me for wow. 500 pay a portion of the rent each month, and start my own business. And at the time, I was still in high school. I had a job at the grocery store. So I figured if it went belly up, I'm not out much. Right. It, was a, it was a good low risk way to get into business. That is pretty cool. So you started with a pretty minimal budget. Let's talk about that and how you allocated the funds that you had to officially get started. Yeah, at the time I had the $500 that I made at the card show and then whatever I was making at the grocery store, which is probably, I don't know, 100 a week or so. And basically <laughs> right. what I did is took all the money I was getting from my grocery store job and I would put that into inventory for my cards. The, the inventory was pretty depleted when I came into that store. So I started mm -hmm. carrying supplies to store people's cards in. I started carrying the newer packs. I started buying collections from people that came in. I put everything I had into building up my inventory. If you're watching this as a business owner who's operating a collectibles card business, keep watching the video because DJ is gonna share an amazing hack that'll help optimize your business. You've been in this business for a long time. What mistakes can you share with us that you've done? And why do you think sports cards and collectible stores fail sometimes? I know a big one for me early on was if someone came into my store and said, I saw a cheaper price at another store. That really bothered me and I felt like I had to lower my price. Mm -hmm. And I finally learned I can't do that. I, I need to put the best price I can, but I'm not always gonna be the cheapest on things. So I, I had to learn profit margin, profit markup, just a quick example, if I, if I buy something for $100 and I sell it for $150, that's only a 33% margin on the profit. You, you need to make sure you're at least making a 33% margin when you're selling things. Don't feel like you always have to be the cheapest. Mm -hmm. Okay. What you did when you opened in 1990 is quite different than what you're doing now in terms of customer building, right? Let's right. talk about what you're doing today to build your customer base and retain it. Okay, uh, one thing I do is I have a kids club. I have a little card that I give to all the kids that come in and every month they can bring it in and get a free sports card up to $2 or a free Lego minifigure. So every time a new family's coming in, I'm handing those right over. And I don't make them sign up, email, nothing. I just hand it over. I use the internet a lot to draw people into my store. A lot of dealers back 
years ago shut down their stores and went more just totally internet. And mm -hmm. I remember thinking, I want to use the internet, but I still want to have my store too. So I use the internet to draw people to my store. I'm constantly, daily, loading my website with new collections we've picked up, mm -hmm. new products that have just arrived, special events. And we just had an autograph authenticator here yesterday and people could bring their autographs and get them authenticated. Wow. We put that on our website. You paid for that, obviously. Yeah, they, yeah. they pay too, but yeah, it, it, there's a fee to get it done. Mm -hmm. So I'm using Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, my website, everything I can, not necessarily to sell product, Okay. but to show what's in the store and draw people here. I, my, my big goal is still that in-store experience. And, and I found with sports card stores, people are very loyal since there's not many of us out there. Mm -hmm. If they come in and find you and they like you, they will keep coming back and they'll tell their friends. Customers for life? Yes. What do you expect your sales revenue to be for 2021? What can you tell us on that? Just curious. It, it's looking really good. It, it will, the, the, not the profit, but the actual sales will probably be in the high six figures. Okay, but you don't know these deals? No, I hand that all over to my wife and she takes care of it all. <laughs> <laughs> I truly don't know. Awesome, okay. Uh, DT, let's talk about the percentage of sales yeah. uh, online versus brick and mortar here at the store. Okay. And what platform are you using specifically for e-commerce to, to sell your product? Uh, most of my sales are in store. Again, I use okay. the internet extensively to draw people to my store and I really want a good in-store experience. My best inventory is here. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the online has been great in giving me a platform to get rid of maybe inventory that did, just sat around here and didn't sell or things that would sell better in other regions of the country or even different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. I sell on ebay.com, good platform, fees are high, and it's not a magic bullet. That. It takes a lot of work. You deal with customers that want to return stuff because they'll claim there's a scratch on it. I also sell on Beckett.com. Beckett, Beckett, Beckett okay. has been the leading price guide for sports cards for decades, and they also have a platform where you can sell your cards mm -hmm. through their website. And they have some great tools where I can list things quickly using all of their data for pricing and mm -hmm. checklists. And they also have a neat feature where I can take a card like this, I can list it on my Beckett.com store, and on eBay at the same time. They can, the same card. The same card. They'll let me launch thousands of cards at a time from my Beckett, st my Beckett store to my eBay store. Mm -hmm. And if this sells on eBay, it'll take it down off the other site oh, wow. okay. so I don't double sell it and take it out of my inventory. What's the percentage of sales though? Like in store, is it 80%, 90%? Yes, easily, easily okay. 80 or more percent in store and more 20% online. But, but there's been times when it's been higher over the years. And mm -hmm. one thing that's been good is by, by kind of diversifying like that, by having your feet in both waters, if the store's slow, your online sales might be doing good and that right. carries you through tougher times or even vice versa. Maybe the online slows down, but maybe your store's having a good stretch. So I definitely encourage doing both. What other mistakes that come to mind that are really important that people can hopefully avoid getting into this business? When I first moved to this location, I did not want to spend the money on a sign. I was kind of watching my pennies and I didn't put up a sign for a while and a lot of people didn't find me. When I finally put the money in and got a good sign, my business really got better. So I would say get good signage, not just a sign on top of your store, but find out what your city's rules are mm -hmm. for sandwich board signs, banners, get whatever permission you need to and get nice banners made, nice sandwich board signs made. Get them out there so people driving by see you. There you go, guys. That's a big tip. Uh, how much was the sign? I'm curious, because you were trying to save money. At the time, it was about $5,000 and that was 30 years ago. So it'd probably be wow. at least double that now, but it's worth every penny. Worth every penny. Okay, by the way, you guys, uh, uh, our today's sponsor is a company that makes Business Signs, it's twodaybanners.com. Check them out in the description below. They're gonna give our viewers a special discount. All the information is in the description. I know you mentioned it in the other questions, but like valuing different cards, right? Can we look at maybe some of your best sellers? Um, profit margins on that? particular product? Sure. Well, I'll start with this. New product is extremely hot right now. Okay. There were many years in this industry where I struggled to get a 33% margin on new product and there was very stiff internet competition. Now the opposite is true. There's so much demand for new product that I'm selling through everything I can get and it's a struggle to keep my really? shelves full okay. and the margins are tremendous. And now, sometimes I'm making 100, 200% markup on the new product, but wow. as soon as I run out, they're gone. Yeah. And there's many cases where I would have to pay more to restock it than what I sold it for. Mm -hmm. So the trick is trying to get as much as I can 
directly from Topps and Panini and the direct distributors, put the best price I can on it, factoring in what it's going to cost me to restock, and then try to have enough until the next new product comes in. But right now, the margins on this stuff is incredible. A challenge you will have if you're opening a new store is trying to get accounts with Topps and Panini, because years ago, they were begging people to open accounts and mm -hmm. open a store. Now, so many people want accounts, they don't have enough product to go around. So it would be very challenging to be able to get an account with Topps and Panini. But it's possible if you get your store open and you can show them you're doing unique things, it's possible you'd be able to get that. Okay. So this business is really unique because you can't really go take a three-month class and all of a sudden become an expert in collectibles and so on. I mean, you've been doing this for a long time, right? right. Any suggestions on people that just have a passion for it? They don't know where to start. They don't know as much as you know now. I would say what to get your, get your feet wet by selling at a card show. Okay. Do some online selling. You know, get, get a little bit of experience being a buyer and a seller. Mm -hmm. After that, if you want to continue to pursue that, I would get an account on DealerNetB2B.com. It's a okay. great community where dealers buy and sell. You'd have to have your business license for this. But uh, you can buy and sell inventory there as well as talk to other dealers that are, that are great about sharing information and tips. And then I would consider uh, con attending the industry summit that's held yearly. All the main, major manufacturers are there. Hundreds of dealers attend. And the, this, this dealer community has always been great about sharing ideas and supporting each other. There, awesome. we, we went through a lot of tough times together and we're all very strong and supportive and helpful to each other. What's the summit called? Is there a title or is it changing every year? Uh, it's called the summit. Uh, okay. It's sometimes called the industry summit. We could follow up and get more information on that. Okay, awesome. You mentioned buying uh, inventory, buying cards. Let's talk about where you source these things. Do you, do you yourself go to eBay and find something and buy it to resell it here? Customers, let's talk about that. Um, almost everything I get is stuff that walks in my store here. When the phone rings and people say, are you buying? I say, yes. There were many years when the industry was struggling and people were constantly being told, we're not buying cards, we're not buying cards. I always told people, yes, I wanna see what you have for sale. Mm -hmm. Even the most seemingly junky collection will usually have something in it that's unique or fun that I can sell. Mm -hmm. So let people know that you are buying, treat people fair, don't take advantage, Tell them what you're going to sell it for and what you're willing to pay. Be honest about everything. You don't want them to, you don't want them to see you put something on your website for a high price later and you cheated them on it. Yeah. Treat everybody honest. I've had many people come and tell me that, or, that they heard, they came to bring a collection to me because they heard someone else sold a collection here and they were treated right. So make it known that you're buying and, and pay well, treat people honest, and then use the internet to get real-time prices to see what things are worth. Mm -hmm. A big mistake people make when valuing collectibles is they go onto the internet and find a random website and get a price for it. Don't do that. Find a website that shows you actual sold prices to see what things are really selling for. eBay completing listed, completed listings is good. Also a site called sellthepeak.com. Sell the Peak Collectibles shows you actual sold prices for what things are selling for. Mm -hmm. So use that so you have an accurate idea of what things are worth and what you should be selling them for. Okay. Hi, DJ, let's talk uh, briefly about you know, just your relationship with the employees. Over the last 30 years, what have you learned in terms of finding good employees, where to find, look for them, how to retain them, what do you offer them in terms of benefits to keep them, just anything and everything about that. I, you know, I try to pay a decent wage, I try to be very flexible if they need time off or vacations, I try to be a kind uh, boss if they if they need some training and stuff to try to, to do that patiently and not be, make people feel bad that maybe there's an area they need to improve. Mm -hmm. So just to try to treat them nice and, and keep them happy. Any specific uh, training you do for them, with them, you send them anywhere or is it pretty straightforward? No, it's all kind of experience through the store. I think okay. the big thing I need is someone that is comfortable just helping customers that can look people in the eye and be friendly and say hello. And mm -hmm. even if you're not good at that, you're willing to at least work on that and get better at it. You can mm -hmm. practice and, and make the effort. And uh, don't steal from me. I've had, I, I sell inventory that's very small and you're usually hiring people that have some kind of interest in collectibles. Right. I've had a lot of employees that steal. So you if, you, if you're just honest and can do a decent job, I love you. And you love what you're doing. Yes. They have that passion. Yep. Okay. 
anything you do different in terms of your competitors, other stores, or maybe that they're not doing that's helping your business and helping uh, the atmosphere, et cetera, for, for your customers? This industry went through a lot of tough times and many stores kind of went to other things to stay in, in flo afloat, you know, mm -hmm. gaming cards or memorabilia. I really tried to stay focused on cards. And even when new product was not selling well at the time, I tried to buy and sell a lot of collections and deal in a lot of single cards. And I have mm -hmm. single cards in every budget. You could come in here with a dollar and still find One something dollar. neat to buy. <laughs> or if you want high end, I've got that too and everything in the middle. But I tried to have a large selection of all kinds of memorabilia, single cards, bobbleheads, programs, everything that there's there's plenty of things to look at. A lot of people say it's like coming into a museum when they come in. Yeah, no, I got lost too. I see you've got a bunch of Lego stuff that you're selling. Um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and I try to branch out too. I try to have something for everybody in the family. I've got Legos, I've got Beanie Babies, I've got something that should appeal to everybody so that there's not one person interested and everybody else in the family saying, hurry up, I wanna go. Right. Out of the platforms that you mentioned, what is giving you the best return that you noticed? And, and specifically, let's dive into what you're doing on those platforms, how you're doing it, any tips, tricks? Probably my website. Again, getting really? it, okay. again, I, I hear from people all the time, I like your website because I can get on every day and see what's new. Mm -hmm. And every, I'll, I'll post things and sometimes within minutes the phone will start ringing. People say, wow. put this aside, I'm gonna be in an hour to pick that up or wow. can you ship this to me? Getting new product up. And I've also been told that the more you update your website, the more you'll get pushed to the top of Google search engines. They mm -hmm. like to see fresh content being loaded all the time and they'll give and, you better search results if you do that. And traffic, obviously. Yes. Yep. Um, uh, what about Facebook, Twitter, how are you using those platforms to show? Uh, what are you doing there? Just posting pictures? Of what that, you that's have? a lot of what I do. And sometimes okay. I'll do other fun things too, like I'll, I'll do a card of the day. I'll pick an interesting trading card, maybe from the past or something unusual, a guy blowing a big bubble on a baseball card or something. I'll say, this is DJ Sports Cards mm -hmm. card of the day and talk about that. I'll try to do some other things that aren't just, here's what I have to sell. I'll try to post just some interesting things to get some hits that way. What are you spending on advertising per month currently? On those platforms, et cetera. Nothing. Nothing. No. Yeah, I haven't. I so you're not doing paper, anything. you know, paper clicks, no. et cetera, things no. like that. Okay. No. What other cards or or categories probably sell the most or or sell well and have? pretty high profit margins. It's, it's pretty much across the board. You've got four main sports. They all sell well. They do, there okay. are times where certain ones will do better than others. Like basketball is extremely hot right now. Mm -hmm. But right now, everything is selling. Even, even weird sports like racing, Olympics, things that years ago people wouldn't even bother with, people will buy that too. Uh, WNBA cards struggle for a long time. Those sell like crazy now, just because people enjoy collecting cards so much. Okay, I wanna show our audience the card that you have, the, the Michael Jordan one. Just curious in terms of numbers, right? You guys, like this card, DJ is selling for $4,000. DJ, are you willing to share with us like where you acquired it, how much you paid for it? Bought it from a collector that I'd known for years. I paid him $2,800 for it. So On good high-end singles, I will pay anywhere from 50 to 75% if it's something I know will sell quickly. Mm -hmm. So if you've got someone coming in with a really hot card, pay them well for it. Again, get a real value off the internet, see what things are really selling for but pay a good percentage. When you get more of a loosey goose collection, a big mix of a lot of cards and it's dollar, two dollar stuff and a lot of it's not gonna sell, you know, do a lower number because you're gonna have a lot of labor and a lot of stuff that won't sell through. But on good hot cards, pay at least half, if not 70 to 75%. Yeah, this business is tricky in the sense that your profit margins are all over the place, right? You yes. mentioned that earlier. You can have 100% there, you can have 10% there. Does it average out to somewhere in the range of what, 40, 50%? Or? Yeah, yeah, okay. if, you're, if you're being smart with things, absolutely. Okay, well, yeah. those are pretty darn good margins. DJ, let's talk about the knowledge and skills that you need to successfully run a sports card and collectibles business. Yep. Okay, well, I think the big thing for me is I've got to run it like a business, I've got to make sure my profit margins are there and that I'm doing things wisely, but at the same time, I want to run it like I'm a collector. I'm trying to set up my store like the stores that I enjoyed going to when I was a collector too. My mm -hmm. favorite dealers, the, you know, the ones that had the good selections, the ones that, that treated me well, their pricing was good. I'm always trying to recreate the best of what I enjoyed when I was a collector. Okay. Um, any skills? I think that what you're talking about is more like knowledge and being experience. Yep. 
Any particular skills that really stand out for people like you who enjoy this and do it very successfully? I think know your uh, know your market, uh, know your customers, remember what they're collecting, look for those things when you're buying collections that you know you have buyers that may want this. Mm -hmm. Know your product. I mean, I've been doing sports cards for over 30 years. I remember stuff from the past. I've got to keep on with what's current. Who are the hot players? What are the hot products? Know, know your inventory mm -hmm. and know what people are looking for. Okay. All in all, what has contributed the most to your success, your revenue, uh, being in this industry for so long? I, I just thank God for providing for my kids. I used to tell people it was proof that there was a God that the fact that I could feed 20 kids running a baseball card shop. And this wow. was during the lean years, of course, that seems silly now, but there were a lot of years people could not believe I could actually take care of that many kids just by running a baseball card store. Wow. But again, just, just doing the things we talked about, treating people honestly, paying your taxes, not cheating, mm -hmm. nothing that I have to go to bed at night and worry about that this is going to get uncovered someday. Just treating people right and praying for God to provide, and here we are. That's amazing. You've got 20 kids? Yeah. That's incredible, you guys. Um, awesome. Okay. Uh, on another note, we've interviewed other sports card and collectible businesses. You guys, make sure you check out those videos on our channel as well. And if you haven't already, we'd appreciate if you subscribed right now. Hit the like button, and thank you for watching. Let's talk about your culture here at the store, right? Mm -hmm. You've got seven employees. Um, how do you create a positive culture for your employees and also most importantly for your customers? What keeps them coming back? Uh, I, I, this is a fun place. I've, I've heard it said where, you know, grocery shopping, the gas station, that stuff people have to do. Mm -hmm. Coming to a card store, that's something people get to do. They look forward to it. They're generally in a good mood and it's usually fun. We, a lot of our customers are our friends and we, you know, so part of the, the employees having a good time here as well as the customers is we, we know each other. We're friends, we get along. A customer might come, might come in and say, hey, is, is Mike here today or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So just, it, we're, it, it's a very friendly, fun atmosphere. People are doing something they enjoy doing and they're in a good mood. We just have a good time. Guys, it's Blitz time with DJ. DJ, let's just dive into the questions. Uh, if you could come up with a slogan for the year 2020, what would it be? Cards boomed while the world suffered. <laughs> okay, um, you, you mentioned 20 kids, what's the best part about being a dad to 20 kids? I'm never lonely. Never. Always got someone that wants to hang out with me. Okay, uh, where did you adopt the kids from? I've got kids from probably every, almost every continent. I've got, we've done uh, Guatemala, Africa, Bulgaria. Okay, <laughs> Yeah. from all over the world. Okay. Yeah. All right, if you could go back in time to meet your 17 year old, what would you tell yourself back then as advice or whatever? When I was 17, I could have bought cases of 86, 87 clear basketball with the Michael Jordan rookies and everybody else for $120. They sell for almost 3 million today. I would have filled my closet. Oh my gosh. Okay, um, can you tell us your feelings when you look up your revenue? I, I'm very thankful. That's awesome. Um, what would you tell I, your I'll just say this real quick too. It took me till I was 49 years old to finally get out of business debt. I mean, I, we went through a lot of tough years, but I'm thankful now that we are finally getting out of all that. That's awesome, okay. All right, last but not least, when you wake up every morning, what, what, what you have to have absolutely, you can't start your morning without. Uh, there's usually some errand I gotta run, but if I don't have to do anything, I just wanna sit, read my Bible, hang out with my wife, and sit my kids next to me. That's awesome. How important is location for a collectibles card store such as yours? And how, any tips and tricks on sort of identifying that? And I, I think, you know, on one hand, collectible stores like this, people will find you. And mm -hmm. now with the internet and places like that, it's, uh, people will find a good collectible store. But at that time, there was, it was harder to get people to find you. And I, I, looking back, I remember thinking this spot was a bad one because you couldn't see it very well from the road. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I still get away. people that come in here and say, wow, I never knew you were here. My spot is kind <laughs> of hidden by years. a big bank and a medical building. And there's people that just don't see me. Okay. So I think get something that's very visible if you can. Yeah, yeah location is key. This is the hack we mentioned in the beginning of the video, and DJ's got more than one, he's got three. So let's dive into that. Let's start with the Kids Club. This has okay. been really great in getting whole families to return to the store. Again, you're, you're giving out free inventory, but at the same time, you're getting return visits constantly. I remember being a kid, 
not having much money, and what a thrill it was when I had like a Radio Shack free battery card or a free card from McDonald's where I could get a burger. And it made me, those businesses, kind of my favorite. And when I right. was older and had money, I continued to frequent them. This is kind of the idea here. And at the same time, I've seen a lot of families embrace this where the dad collects, and now the kids are coming in with dad excited to be here because they're getting something too. So this is a great tip. Number two, try to have stuff in your store for everybody in the family. You don't wanna to diversify too much outside of your main uh, focus, but at the same time, have some things that interest other people. I buy new and used collectibles. I decided to start carrying Lego recently. Have some things for the younger girls. I carry Beanie Babies, some fun toys. Have something that interests everybody. Also have something to keep mom or the visitor that's stuck along for the ride in your store, keep them busy. <laughs> We have free video games that people can come up and they don't got to put a quarter in. But now they're being entertained and they're not in a hurry and wanting everybody else to leave in a hurry. Everybody's relaxed and having a good time in your store. My final tip, and this is the most important, try to recreate the experiences that you had as a collector at your favorite stores. Maybe it was a dealer that had great selection. His prices were good. He threw you in a free bonus once in a while. Try to recreate your favorite dealers and your favorite experiences that you had when you were a collector. That's awesome. I see that passion. Execute on those tips and hacks and your business will grow. I know we've touched on this a little bit, but like building a, a loyal community of customers, right? Yeah. In here, community, other cities that they come in to your store. What are you doing? What's really bringing them back? Anything else? You, you, you treat everybody like you would want to be treated. You treat people honestly. You give them the best price you, you can. You trade with them. You make deals with them. I, I remember a, knowing a dealer in the past that if he could sell something to you for $10 and make a good profit and make you happy, or he could sell it to you for 20 and make a big profit, but later on you're gonna get mad and never come back again, mm -hmm. he would take that 20 and you'd never see you again. And I thought that doesn't make any sense. I wanna keep people long-term, keep them coming back. The best thing you could do is when people walk in your door and they want to do business with you, you treat them right and give them experience after experience. That's awesome. Well, clearly you're doing a great job being here for what, 31 years now? 32? Yes. Yep. That's amazing. We've got a lot of entrepreneurs looking at this video, our channel. Uh, what would your advice be to them just in general? They're getting started or they want to get started in some kind of business industry. What would be a couple pieces of advice from you? I think just get started. There's so many opportunities where you can get your feet wet, like, like we talked about earlier, you know, start off small with a, a card show or do some selling online. Even if you're, you're young, you could be a teenager like I was when I started. There's opportunities for you to start your business now with the internet and with, and with small scale shows and things like that. Just do something and give it a try. And even when you fail, those experiences you get will help you do things better in the future. So don't give up and think, I can't do this. Take those experiences and use them to help you do it right next time. All right, you guys, well, that's a wrap with DJ Sports Cards. I hope you enjoyed his story, um, his uh, advice to you guys. Uh, we hope that you execute on everything you hear. We're here to help your business be successful. And thank you for watching. If you haven't already subscribed, take a second, do that right now. Hit the like button and the bell and watch every other video that we have on our channel. Thank you so much.